is it's the lowest precedence operator in per lock, um, which means that if you, can, you don't have to worry about how you bracket the left hand side, and things like this don't come and bother you. These two may look identical, but the bottom one, actually, this whole expression is in scalar context, so that the output of stat here is a scalar, which they give the sign for this, whereas here, you actually get what you expect, which is the array of information from the stat. Um, so they are something different, and for, for the all died the all died paradigms, which was then to use the textual law rather than the, the vertical bar. Okay, back to the solution. Um, since we're uh, being relatively, since we're trying to be reasonably efficient, we'll actually move that open door outside our event processing loop because, quite frankly, it's not there. Our app is sufficiently broken that we probably don't want to start it until we fix it and find out where event got to. So, moving on, we've still got process events. Um, which is basically, as we said, read the event directory, um, process each event, um, and send the socket. Okay, going back to our little problem where the socket can go away, what happens if it's been away for a while? Our directory is going to get very, very full, particularly with the application owners do, with where it throws about a thousand events a minute. That directory gets quite large. That's reading the whole, whole array, whole directory into an array. If your directory is big, suddenly, um, A, that's going to take a while. B, your application's memory footprint is going out. Uh, and if you're in a memory constrained environment, that can get really not pretty. So let's not do that. Let's instead do that, which says read the next event out of the directory and process it. So at this point, we're only reading one event at a time. We don't have the whole array of memory. Memory footprint drops. Um, time to process the first, first entry drops massively. Um, okay, the other thing we should do, of course, is just make, def defend against somebody dropping garbage in our directory. So we're not going to process anything unless it's a dump event file. Because we have to know. The other thing we're doing, because this is sitting in a loop, and we don't, we can get around having to open, to reopen the directory every time we get into a loop by using rewind, uh, which basically says, also done, rewind, and start reading the directory again. Now, obviously, if there's nothing in the directory, it'll just sit through this loop, sleep one, and keep going. But we've now got something that will read the directory without a heavy memory footprint. Uh, isn't going to come and bite somebody else. Um, well, that's the way. So, moving on to what we do to the events. Open the event file, read it, unserialize it, and then we kind of do stuff, which we'll worry about later. Is there a reason we're not using that for file level? Sorry? Is that the reason that is not Um, no, not really. Okay. Quick example code. The, the real code does. Okay. Um, you, you may also assume there's an awful lot of parameter passing to separate things happening here behind code that you, you're not seeing. Uh, what if any of that lot fails? Oh, joy. Um, this is where eval comes to our help. Um, for those who are not familiar with eval, eval basically takes a block or a string expression, runs it, and if any of it fails, it sets dollar out to, to the error. So it's very useful for the equivalent of Java like exactly that um, Another sidebar. We could, at this point, of course, stick an all die on the end of everything. That gets really boring after a while. So the lovely people, lovely Phil 510 people, came up with auto die. And here's an example of it. Use, we say use auto die, key not be open, which says use auto die on open. Um, Wrap our open in an eval, and then we can use 510 given when, that's shiny, to say, to see whether our open first. Now, this basically just, it's, it's the lazy man's version of sticking in die everywhere, with the advantage that you get a little bit of extra error information back. So, let's do that. Um, yes, syntax error, missing something, hold on, thank you. <laughs> um, so, at this point, we're doing use auto die. I'll open and close, we'll open. If that fails, it'll drop out the eval. If the close fails, it'll drop out the eval. Um, and we then, we're also at liberty at this point to stick any dies in, you know, do stuff subroutine if, if our event is broken or weird in some manner. And we, we can just, we can drop out to the. But, that's ugly. Um, partly because it uses 
a big, because the valley is a little bit strange. So there's a very, very handy module which I commend to you. It's try tiny, which replaces the, the valve with something which looks much more user friendly, namely a try catch. It does exactly the same thing, although it protects you from some of the odd insanities of your valve and got the rack out of the way. Um, and that effectively gives you um, the same process. So we, we can go try, use auto die. Useful thing to note auto die is like something scoped. So because I've only turned it on inside that block, it only happens inside that block. So if there are places like earlier in the code where I actually didn't want to die, but actually wanted to catch, catch the fact that I failed to do something with it in a different manner, I can do that. I could have done that using auto die as well. But. Okay, so. Um, and then we have. So what we'll do is we'll catch and we'll do a bit of clean up. Um, we actually want to do a little clean up um, is to make sure that if we've got a dud event, A, we know about it, and B, we get it out of the queue so we don't keep trying to process it. So again, a little bit of paranoia, what we do is if we um, if we, fail, we we log it, so somebody at some point can come and find our, our error and, and, and catch it. And, hopefully do something about it. We name it to .reject. Now, if for some reason we won't rename, we unlink it. And if that fails, we probably ought to do other things. But, but the point of the exercise here is to clean up after yourself. Yes? What happens if the log fails? Um, <laughs> good question. <coughs> we could log the fact. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you, you can get yourself into really horrible states here. If you, if you, um, I mean, we can print, because print probably succeeds. Um, and we kind of hope this is running in an environment where, where we, somebody will ultimately see the print. Um, so yes, that, that's another place we could have called things. Um, we should probably decide what to do if the unlink fails. If the unlink fails, we now have a garbage event in our, in our event directory, which every single iteration, every single loop around this process is going to fall over every time. So we probably ought to consider that point whether we simply genuinely do want to die and, and not come back. Um, Again, it's something for consideration. Moving on, let's get to sentiment. The sentiment's where the fun starts. This is really simple. <coughs> we print the socket. We serialize the event printed to the socket. You probably don't Yeah, you're right, I don't. Oh, what happens if the print fails? <coughs> so I thought, this came up, and I thought, you know, what happens if I print to a socket and the socket goes away? Let's have a look at the moment. Let's have a look at build off print. <laughs> doesn't actually tell you at all. There is no useful information in there about the return code print. All right. Sorry? It's the second sentence. Returns true if successful. It doesn't tell you what it doesn't fail, does it? Watch this, because this intrigued me when I did it. I wrote myself a little test script. One's, one's called listen.pl, which runs a socket and prints out everything it gets. And one's called talk.pl, which talks to the socket. Three. Two. Hit control C on the listener. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Send another one. Oops, sorry. Send another one, and it just drops silently out the bottom without doing anything. Uh, but more to the point, and, and somewhat more importantly, right here, the client thinks it sent something, and the listener hasn't got it. Um, and if you're in, in the world of writing robust, robust programs, which I was I, I am at this point, I've just lost an event, um, which could be kind of bold, because it could be something like the event informing, informing me that somebody's put Top Gear on for you guys to watch, which would be bad. So, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, um, it turns out that what actually happens if you do that is that print actually throws a sick pipe. Um, which is quite the odd mentioned anyway. So what we in fact do, this is, this is another place, uh, another bit of exception handling is worth getting your head around. Um, SigPipe, basically you can pass it the name of a sub, you can pass it a reference to a sub, you can pass it a piece of abdominance code. And yes, that comma still shouldn't be there. So what we do at this point is we, um, we, we write a SigPipe handler, which is localized to our um, sentiment subroutine. So that if the print dies because the far end's gone away, um, then we die. Now, again, of course, have a slight problem with this. 
um, because we've just killed our app again. Um, so we need to catch that guy. So let's let's go back to our main loop and wrap it in another one. So what we're actually doing here now, if we connect, um, we'll try to process our events. Uh, if we fail, um, if it's seek pipes, we drop out of the loop. So we connect, press through events. If it fails, we drop out of the loop and go back around again. We try reconnect and we try again. Uh, another piece of basically another piece of defensive programming which should hopefully get you around the problem. Um, obviously, um, there are other ways that I haven't covered that in which the process event loop might, event loop might die. Um, and we may need to catch those at this level, we may need to catch those a bit further down. Um, so that's that. Another one that occurred to me is a config file. We'll, we'll read this in fairly standard way using config general. Perhaps the config file's broken. Now, obviously, you'd like it to die. But unfortunately, if you actually call config general on a broken config file, it just warns you, which is not very helpful. So, handy pseudo signal, um, sig1. So basically, again, inside our read config, we can trap warns, and if um, if our signal, if if our config parser dies, um, then uh, sorry, throws up a warning because our file is crap. Um, then we can actually die on that and, and get someone to go and fix it. Um, moving on. What if we get run twice? Uh, now my notes for this simply contain one person's name. Yeah. From time back when I used to work for info.com, when we had a bunch of interesting scripts which cleaned stuff up, and some of them didn't have any protection against being run more than once. So, so the end result of this was that our, our main machine used to wind up with 57 processes called cleanup, all trying to fight for the same resources, and used to bring bring the uh, Bring the thing to his knees, and, and, and the cry the cry of said person's name used to go up on Jagadish. Uh, oops, sorry, shouldn't name, should I? Um, of please fix your code. Um, now, if you remember, in our in our nice little um, nice little skeleton of this program, we had um, a note saying become demon. Now it was a very handy little uh, module for this. Well, in fact, there were several. So there's more modules for demonizing things than you know what in in, in other app demons quite nice. Basically, if you call, if you run it, if, if you include it as part of your um, your script, then you get it does some argument parsing for you. So you can say your script start, which will start with script as a demon. Your script stop, um, your script status, which tells you whether it's running or not. And there's also a minus x option, which allows you to not run it as a demon. So you can you can throw the debugger at it, nothing useful things. But most important of all, it drops a pip file when it starts. And if you try and start two of them, the second one goes, I'm already running. Um, it never ceased to amaze me working for quick info how many people fail to make, uh, make their long running processes drop too fast. The number of times we have to clean up the main login machine for, for rubbish. So, that's easy. It's possibly the simplest little extra piece of code we write in there. Um, use that thing, use that demonize. Oh, cool, demonize. What have we missed? <laughs> Lots. I'm sure we've missed lots. Um, the one that occurred to me, um, that's probably going to come and bite me on the ass with this code, is every single bit of data I'm mangling here is externally supplied. And I have no idea what character encoding it's in. <laughs> um, and particularly if I'm going to take something from my config file, which may be Latin 1, and append it to something from my event object, which may be in the UTFA, and then output it to the socket in some, yeah, there's, there's no consideration of encoding doing up there. I'm sure there should, uh, and there probably should be. I'm sure there's a whole pile of other things that could go wrong, and probably will. Um, I guess, I guess the summary is, is that this isn't this isn't a simple problem. That write, writing the pill to do to, to do what you wanted to do is only half the job. Because it can go wrong, and it will go wrong. Um, and if there's any point which you look at your code and thinking that can't possibly happen, bet your ass it can. Uh, more, more of a comment, really, that I, I think using mid files can be quite dangerous because if your daemon dies in an unexpected way, it might leave the bid file behind. 
and you can end up with that bid for yeah. point into a process that's completely independent to when you run stop, it kills the wrong process. So there's lots of um, yeah. There's lots of pitfalls, as it were. <laughs> um, well, there are things you can do. One of the things you can do with that is, of course, is make sure make sure your app has a sick dolly handle that kills pitfall, which I think AppDeem does. Um, you also yeah, let's say let's say you take over the uh, operating system lock on the pitfall, yeah. and then you can detect it if someone else. Yeah, you, you can detect it a yeah. lot. Um, there, there's, there's basically there's, healthy, there's quite a healthy amount of paranoia in that was written by Mike Shilly, who also wrote off the pearls, so uh, hopefully it doesn't break. The way so you can also do you, you open up the ends block, yep. and make sure you attach the games, because otherwise if you don't, your end block. Somebody will control block. your end block when you least expect it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the, the way we um, often handle uniqueness is uh, to have a uh, like local you know, GCP or Unix uh, socket. Uh, like there's a control socket, so you've got a lot more runtime control over the process, and you know that the kernel itself is going to make sure that you can't bind the same locker twice. That's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all good. Ooh, I thought that one. But yeah, it's a really nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, like your toes the more you think about it. But yeah, I think, I think the, the takeaway from this is that the real world will come and bite you on the arse, so code against it. And, and there's, hopefully there's a few tools that will, will, will make that a little easier. How do you test? <laughs> How do you write tests that exercise your all that plans? Um, one of the ones that actually I actually found the hardest was testing this whole thing with, with sockets going away. Um, because you actually need to fire off of a child process to, to do the listener approach. Um, test fork is very handy for that. As that will actually allow you to fork off a child and um, do stuff in it. I think my unit test for that actually has test fork and a couple of sleeves. Um, I found uh, utilizing IP tables and using simulated as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think mine actually just did a, just thought, thought of the listener and did a, ran a couple of things, um, did a sleep, sleep one close, and then the, 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 the non first one you know, did a sleep two. Which is a bit sort of taking on faith that things are going to take less than, less than finite time to run. But, so there are probably cleaner ways of doing it, but it's, it's nasty. Um, I, also, it does go without saying, but every time you put in a piece of paranoid like, noia like this, write a unit to test for it first, and make sure it fails, and then fix it. Yep. It's more of a thing that if you put a long-running daemon, sometimes you have no idea what it's doing. If you track the input, you can give out yourself a yep. send of a that, that's kind of what acting states does, but I suspect I think all that does is actually read the pit file. So yes, having having a way to ping it and find out what it's doing is quite neat. Okay, well I think the hall's descending for the next one, so thank you very much.